buying the right stuff what routers and what interfaces now I don't know how many of you are like me but I consider myself just a, a geek at heart I love technology I love going into stores like Best Buy and I don't even care I don't I don't care about radio equipment I don't watch TV I don't even look at the CDs I just walk straight over to the network aisle I know what's going to be there. I know it's just going to be network cards, hubs, switches, little routers, you know, off-brand names because they, they, you know, Best Buy is the all-in-one, so they don't really even carry name brand stuff like Cisco routers or something like that. But I just, I love just standing in that aisle, and I could stand there, 10, 20 minutes, just looking, picking up boxes. Look at that spec. Look at that. You know, I, I, it just, it floats my boat. So when I get to a, a nugget like this, I just get excited because we're going to be talking about the technology that can make this happen. Now, for those of you that are taking the certification exam and are kind of the certification-driven folks, and that's all you want, you don't even really care about the technology, then this section probably isn't for you because Cisco doesn't like to test on router models and individual interface numbers and, and cards and things like that because it changes all the time. New stuff is always coming out, and that means they would always have to revise the exam. But for those of you that are really looking to get into this, I mean get into it in the real world, that's why I added this section is because a lot of times I know this is one of the first voice over IP courses that people typically will take and they'll walk away from this and go okay I got the theory I got the syntax I know how to do but I have no idea where to even get started with what to actually buy so that's what I wanted to do here walk through the old routers you know that's one of the glory things that Cisco did was they equipped all their old equipment to be capable I shouldn't say all I shouldn't say all, most of their old standard equipment to be capable of voice over IP. The new routers I'll walk through as well, and this is where I just get excited because I love new stuff. I love the new silver look. I love the console port sitting in the front of the router. I love that. And that's what I'm going to look at when we get to the new routers, the new 2800, the 3800 series, you know, some of the new interfaces that we can plug in there. So that's what this whole section is dedicated to is the new Cisco stuff and what you're going to need to buy for a voice over IP network. All right. One of the first questions you might have is, what do you mean by old? What's an old router? Well, I hate even using the word old because these are routers that still exist in, in most businesses in America nowadays that have Cisco gear. I mean, 2600, 3600, these things aren't going away for a long time. What I don't mean by old, let me first start with that. What I don't mean by old is things like the 2500 series router or one of those ACS boxes that Cisco didn't even label with a, a router number. I mean, the, when I say old, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I would consider that archaic, like museum. I know it's 10 years, 12 years old, but you know, in the world of technology, 10 to 12 years is it's old. So in this case, the old routers, I really mean, I guess, mainstream routers, things that have been in businesses for years and are typically used and equipped with new mod modules as new functionality comes out. I want to walk through these series, one series at a time, and talk about how they've been equipped for the new voice interface cards and the new voice over IP systems. So let's start from the bottom and work our way up. First off, the 800 series. Now the 800 series, back when they looked like this, were kind of, I don't know, I, they didn't excite me. They kind of looked like an Xbox, if you will. Uh, it, it had one or two ports in the back, but um, the 800 series, what do you say about it? It was designed for Soho users. It had DSL connections, typically one Ethernet port. Sometimes you could even upgrade them and get a serial port. Ooh, a serial port on our 800 series router. Now, they did come out with one that caught my eye. It was the Cisco 827-4V router. And this is the only 800 series router that supports VIC interfaces. It actually has, as the name implies, four built-in FXS ports. So here's the picture I want to paint. We can have one of these routers over here and have four little analog phones connected, up to four, I should say, analog phones plugged in, connected to a VPN back to the corporate office. So we could be running voice over IP for somebody's house and not even have an IP phone there. They could have their, you know, their standard little cordless handset over here plugged into the router, and that could be their work extension. 
talk about a cost savings. You won't even have to buy an IP phone. Uh, you see a lot of companies doing this like Vonage where they just ship you a little adapter that converts your old analog handset into a voice over IP device. So that's where this 827 came in and I thought, wow, that's awesome. This is great, an 800 series router that supports FXS ports. And then I go to Cisco's site recently and I find out it's end of life. So the 827-4V model, may it rest in peace. It will no longer be around. Because they've come out with these new routers. And this is, see, now this is where I get excited. These new routers have antennas. So that tells you it's now an integrated service router. They're providing multiple services with one box. These are the upper upper level series. Uh, you're seeing like uh, 850 series now that are coming out. And these have the ability, some of these real high-end 800 series ones, have the ability of using our VIC cards that are used in the uh, 2600 series or 2800 series, you know, the, the, uh, the two FXS ports. So we can add FXS ports. But primarily, in a huge way, these routers are meant to connect to a home network. They, you can even have a built-in switch here. A home network that has a Cisco IP phone on it. So instead of using an analog device, you can co-locate an IP phone at somebody's home office and have that connect across the VPN back to the main office. Oh, I forgot my little and right here. So this provides support for VPN and quality of service services over our DSL, cable, and ISDN network that immediately tells you this is designed for a SoHo environment. Now with that being said, the only time I've encountered an 800 series has been in a home office. I've seen somebody use it at a home. Uh, once you get into a small business, meaning that you actually have office space purchased for the company, most people will go straight into the 1700 series, also known as the box that rocks. Now, you won't be able to type that into Cisco's website. That's my name for it. I love this 1700 series. And the reason why is because it's so scalable. I guess if anything looks like an Xbox, it's probably these guys. But it's kind of the router design for, I guess you could call it the squishy middle. There's a squishy middle between a home office and a small office and a medium office. You know, it's kind of like this, this small to medium. You know, do you have 10 people? Do you have 100 people? It's squishy. So this thing is designed to support offices that can scale up to, look at this, around 300 users. And I'm talking 300 busy users to actually max this thing out. These are capable of handling Ethernet, fast Ethernet interfaces, uh, handling DSL, cable modem, T1 lines. I mean, they're, they're, really, they're really cool. And they are great because the interfaces that they use are the same modules that they use for the 2600, 3600, 2800. I mean, it's the same modules. So once you buy in, I mean, Cisco calls it investment protection. I pretty much say once you buy in, you're in. I mean, you, the modules are the expensive piece. It's not the shell. So once you buy your modules, it's a lot cheaper to upgrade just by buying new shells like a 2600 or 3600 series router and just keeping your same modules all the way through. Now, I put the two most popular are the 1751 and 1760. I should add to that uh, on this for voice. These are the two most popular models that I've seen for the voice over IP environment. The most popular 1700 series router I've seen is the 1720. Uh, it looks like this top one. It's really thin. It only supports two modules. And most of the time you'll see this supporting like a T1 line uh, for a small business that has purchased a T1 internet connection. These things uh, are, I'm not going to say going away because they are so popular. I think these little uh, desk mountable ones, meaning it's not rack mountable, will stay. I think this is the 1760 down here. I think this one will go away uh, because that will be replaced by the 1800 series, which adds a lot more features. The big advantage, I guess, you get of this, I know it's kind of a superficial advantage, but it doesn't have to be rack mounted. I have one of these sitting on my desk routing my internet connection at home, and it takes up a very small footprint on the desk. It doesn't kick out a lot of heat. It's not loud like a lot of the rack mountable series routers. So uh, it really is designed for a small office that maybe doesn't have a dedicated IT room. Because once you get a dedicated IT room, you'll definitely see at least one of these routers. I've seen so many 2600s, it's just silly. They've lost their mesmeration for me. I'm not mesmerized by the 26. Is mesmeration a word? I'm not mesmerized by these anymore just because they're everywhere. 2600 is Cisco's flagship router, and I would venture to say the most popular router 
in the world as of right now for, for major medium to medium to large businesses. Now it says small to medium businesses, but I've seen these things in large, small, medium, they're, they're just everywhere. Now they revamped this product line and it's kind of like a temporary revamp uh, in the year 2003 and released the XM. You see the 2600 XM series. And now the XM is the only one that you can buy. And for the voice world, most of the time you'll be looking at getting an XM module. Uh, model, I should say, because the XM is this series re-released to I include increased processor and memory capacity. The old 2600, I think, only supported a max, and I could be off on this, but I think it's a max of about 32 megs of RAM and 16 megs of flash, which for our iOS versions that have voice over IP capabilities is nowhere close to what we need. I mean, if you want to run voice over IP on a 2600 non-XM, you can do it, but you'll have to use one of the older iOSs that probably don't have a lot of the features that we need. So the XM increases it to now you, you can support 128 megs of memory. Um, 32 or 64 megs of flash, I think, is around the range of how much flash you can. Uh, yep, it's 64 megs of flash because I have one that has 64 megs. So that allows you to include support for all the latest and greatest iOS versions. Now, with that being said, this, these routers, the XM series, do not have built-in support for VIC cards. I can't slide a voice interface card into these modules. Let me grab my pointer right here. These modules right over here. I need my blue marker. Our built-in interfaces. Um, we need to add one of these carrier modules, which pretty much eat up your entire network module slot. Uh, I'll show you the modules a little bit later. But we have the NM1V and NM2V modules that I can slide in there to give me support for VIC cards. So this is why the 2600 and even the XM series, which is a fairly new series, I have put into the classification of the old routers. It's because they don't have the support for all the new interfaces that Cisco has released for voice over IP. The same goes for the Cisco 3600 series. While this is one of Cisco's flagship routers, I would say combine the 2600 and 3600 series, and you've got the majority of the Cisco routers that you'll encounter in the real world. This router does not support VIC interfaces out of the box. The only 3600 series that they still make is the 3662, and that's because they never came up with a comparable model of 3700 series. Uh, back in the day, I would say four or five years ago, maybe even less, the three major models of this that you'll find, oh, let me get to a drawable layer, layer here, uh, is the 3620, the 3640, and the 3660. And this allowed you to have your two modules in the 3620, four modules in the 3640, and six modules in the 3660. The reason this one is still around and they still manufacture it is because this is the only model of router of the 3600 series that provided built-in fast Ethernet interfaces. So they kept it around because we actually had to add modules in the 3620 and 40 to get Ethernet. And when they went to the 3700 series over here, they gave it a new look. These are the two 3700 series, but they also added built-in interface support for fast Ethernet, which was a great invention because you don't want to eat up one of your full modules just to add Ethernet capabilities. So in all of these router models, we still have to buy the carrier modules to add voice interface support to support VIC cards like FXS and FXO. I keep emphasizing the point of those carrier modules because that's one of the major benefits you'll get when you move up to one of Cisco's new models called integrated services model routers is those carrier modules will go away and those are an expensive purchase. So the final old router I'll talk about, well I, I should say the final mainstream old router is the 72, 74, 7500 series router. These are typically found in enterprise businesses and service providers. And the most hilarious thing I've, I've seen is this, the 7200 is, it looks kind of like this, a little smaller. The 7200 is the number one most popular managed router that I've seen. For instance, if you want somebody else to manage your, your services, like you pay AT&T uh, to manage your router, the 7200 series I've seen everywhere, and it's hilarious because this is designed for a service provider. It has a huge capacity. I mean, it, compared to the, the routers we just talked about, this can route so much more and is capable of so much more. And the number one most common configuration I've seen for a 7200 series is you'll have 
a T1 line connected to a fast interface module right there. That's it, and that's the only connection. I don't know why. Maybe maybe these carriers got a huge discount by buying a ton of these routers, but this is the most common configuration I've seen for the 7200 series, and it makes me cry. I shed a tear every time I see that because this router is capable of so much more, but has been reduced to just a T1 line because that is what people will typically use for their managed router services. Um, so this is designed for enterprise and service providers, high-speed interface, high-speed processors, lots of memory, a huge amount of capacity. The module interfaces from the mainline routers are not compatible with this, and the truth is these don't even support voice interface cards. The main reason I include them and we're talking about our voice routers is because their primary objective is to move packets, and Cisco has increased these routers to support all the quality of service mechanisms that are supported in their mainline routers. So if you are an enterprise business, if you are a service provider environment, and you need to prioritize voice, these routers are going to be the ones that you use to do it. Now the last router that managed to weasel its way into the old router category is the VG200 series. And the only reason I put this into the old routers is because it is rather old. It came out five or six years ago when I first got into voice over IP and it came out as the VG200 it wasn't a series now if you search for VG200 you'll only find them on eBay nowadays because Cisco doesn't make them anymore the original VG200 looked identical to the 2600 seri series router but only had a fast Ethernet port and two modules for VIC cards a 2FXS or 2FXO port and it was under a thousand bucks. It was a very cheap router in terms of Cisco, but only provided two voice interface cards. So that was all I could do with it. So Cisco said, you know what? It's not scalable. It doesn't even support serial ports. It doesn't support routing protocols. It's a piece of junk. So they discontinued it and came out with now the modern ones, the VG, it's called, oh, dyslexia, VG224 and VG248. The router that you see above my writing right here is the VG248. And these two are geared to provide bulk FXS ports. What they have is they have an Ethernet port over here, and they come with a Amphenol connector. The VG224 comes with one Amphenol connector, and the VG248 comes with two. Now, for those of you that haven't heard of an Amphenol connection before, I, I know I never had when I first got into it. It is actually a big port that looks like, if you've been in computer computers for a while, it looks like the old, old serial ports that we used to have on our uh, computers to connect like scanners and things like that. Um, it looks like a very old serial port. But an Amphenol cable will plug into this, and it will run to a patch panel that allows us to splice in, uh, for each one of these, these ports, 24 FXS ports. So these are primarily used if we have a ton of analog connections or we need to trunk over to an old voicemail system that supports am uh, Amphenol trunks or will support a, a bunch of patch panel connections through FXS ports. Uh, for example, let me give you a picture uh, so you can see this. Let's say we've upgraded our network, you know, everything is now voice over IP, but Cisco Unity is a very pricey purchase. It runs uh, on average for licensing alone about 300 bucks per user. So people might say, you know what, Unity, shh, forget that. I'm keeping my old voicemail system. Well, to make your old voicemail system compatible with the new voice over IP network, you'll have to trunk over to it. And a lot of the old voicemail systems will support things like the Amphenol connectors, so we can trunk 24 lines over there and have 24 users using voicemail all at the same time. Now, this will never have serial ports or anything like that. It only has Ethernet uh, connectivity and provides basic services for all the phones. So things like caller ID, uh, hold, transfer, conference, all those things will be supported for the legacy devices. And we can use it for fax and modem connections as well. So this is just a quick way to add a lot of FXS ports to our network. And now we move on to the new routers. Pretty slick looking, huh? We actually have these routers that now it seems like all of them have antennas because all these series of routers are known as the integrated services routers. This is kind of Cisco's mission to integrate multiple service, meaning security, voice, video, wireless, all network mediums into a single platform. So let's take a look starting off with the 1800 series.
Now, the 1800 series has been revamped to have little antennas on most of their boxes. This is, again, designed just like the 1700 series for the telecommuters, the Soho, the, even the medium offices as you get up here to the 1841. Now, this 1841 is a modular router. All the rest of these are fixed interface. And you can see that CISO kind of has in mind to slowly move away from that 800 series and replace those home routers with this 1800 series. Now, this 1841 uses all the same modules from the older routers and the new routers. I put sweet. That's fantastic. So we have this, this common platform that is able to house all the modules from all the old and all the new modules that are coming out there. Now, you saw on the previous slide, they even have a wireless module that allows you to add wireless functionality to a router like this. Now, these all typically have built-in, except this 1841 just has fast Ethernet, but has built-in ADSL, DSL, cable-style connections uh, that will allow you to connect to typically the mediums that will be found in a Soho office. Now, this is the first integrated service router designed to be the ultimate all-in-one box to where you don't have to have multiple pieces of equipment to do multiple things. A lot of them will have a built-in switch. A lot of them will have wireless capabilities. Uh, the routing functions all in one box. The 2600 series has become the 2800 series. And you find out that these things just went through a major overhaul. Not only did they get their processor and their memory increased, but they just got a whole new look to them. As you see right here, this, I mean, this, we have the, uh, the upper end 2800 series router, which has, it looks like a 3640. It has the, the modular slots in the back. But now we see all of the, the primary interfaces that we deal with as administrators move to the front. All of our console port, our auxiliary port, our power supply, and all that has been moved to the front of the router from the back. Now, there is a 2801. This is actually what I have. I purchased one of these for my uh, office. And this, this router right here is an integrated service router that looks very similar to the 2600 series, except they've got the new look. You've got over here the two, oh, the two built-in uh, fast Ethernet ports to where we can now have uh, fast Ethernet without any, any modules being added. We have built-in functionality for VIC ports, like these are all right here, the four FXO modules that allow you to add the FXO ports built in. You don't have those carrier modules. And what that means is we have digital signal processors, known as DSP chips, built on the motherboard of these routers. That's what used to be on those carrier modules, those NM1Vs and NM2Vs. The main reason we had to have those is because we didn't have digital signal processors, which are just little processors used primarily to convert analog voice to a voice over IP format. Now, this is uh, the next level up of 2800 router. And all these, I mean, you, you get a new look. They use compact flash memory. NVRAM, as we know, it is gone because all of our running config and everything is stored in the flash of the router. The flash, most of the time, will be the compact flash that we find in digital cameras. Uh, one admin, one uh, network administrator that has these told me that he had a problem with somebody swiping his flashcards for their digital cameras. They saw the flashcard and they're like, hey, I could use that. And they yanked it right out of the router. I never asked him what his router was doing out in public, but they are the same as, as what we use for digital cameras, so be careful with that. Now, our 3600 and 3700 series routers have moved to the 3800 series. These things are awesome. Look at them. I mean, just look at them. Moment of silence for the 3800 series. There it was. It was... These things are, are, first off, I put their thick routers, meaning they have a lot of module supports. And the first time I saw this, I saw this picture, I was like, whoa, what are this? I mean, are these our console ports? These are actually dual power supplies. That's right. These things have become production material enough to where they have dual power supplies inside of them. They're the true integrated service ultimate all-in-one box, but now for a large business environment. For example, this box can support 2,500 VPN tunnels. And I look at that, I'm like, wow, you know, we've taken a VPN concentrator and moved it inside of this box. Supports 70, uh, 720 SRST IP phones. I mean, that's an entire company, IP phones. And SRST, I don't know if we've talked about that yet, survives, stands for Survivable Remote Site Telephony, which means if your call manager servers are out of commission, the router will take over and support the IP phones until you get them back online. And this router can support 720 IP phones, which compared to the, I know the 2600 off the top of my head, supports 48 
48 IP phones. I mean, you compare 2600 to, to 3800, and you can tell it's gone through a major revamp in memory and processor utilization. They've also added a lot of the intrusion detection and prevention systems that come in the PIX firewall. And you see why, why it earned this name, Integrated Services, is they've really taken a lot of their dispar disparate platforms, the PIX, the VPN concentrator, the router, and even switch modules, and moved them into this 3800 series. Finally, the last router, as we saw the old routers, this is the router designed for the service provider. Again, we don't have compatibility still with our uh, business class routers, but this is primarily designed to handle extreme speed networks. Uh, I put service providers in mothership size companies that had, uh, for instance, I've seen uh, uh, the network for, oh, now they're slipping my mind. Who's the shipping? DHL the network for DHL, a shipping company here in the United States, and they have some of these routers. They're just enormous, and they're primarily designed to do a core network of MPLS and Metro Ethernet style connections. And if you haven't heard of these things before, uh, this is a label switching method of, of routing, which allows you to route at extremely high speeds and gives you a ton of other features, which I don't have time to get into. But when you see something like Metro Ethernet, Metro Ethernet is the new style of WAN links. Uh, back in the days, the remember the, the, uh, new, the new Y2K kind of new hot thing was the dot-com companies. And, you know, if you put a dot-com behind your business name, everybody invested in you. Is the, is the heyday of economies. One good thing that came out of those days was that these dot-com companies started tearing up streets all over the metropolitan area of North America and laying fiber optic cable everywhere. And when all the, the companies crashed, you know, when the downturn of the, turn of the economy hit, we had all this fiber that was just left over in the streets, and it got the nickname Dark Fiber, which a lot of people use nowadays for Metro Ethernet, meaning throughout metropolitan areas, you can get 1,000 meg WAN links, typically a lot cheaper than you can a T1 line. That's, I mean, it's just fiber that's unused under the streets. And that's one of the major things that's happening in economies today is we're seeing a lot of fiber strands laid everywhere. Fiber is the new preferred network connection medium because you can go a virtual unlimited distance with it and get extreme high speeds. This will be the technology that takes our WAN links to the same level of LAN connections. So this is the switch, or router I guess you could call it, that is meant to manage these style of connections. Very high throughput, very high processor resources. Um, these are high speed routers. They have on the upper end the 720 gigabit per second backplane, which if it rings a bell, probably does because it is the same backplane as the 6500 series switch with the uh, SOUP 720 module, uh, supervisor module inside of it. So these are routers that can now handle the same style of speeds as our 6500 core switches uh, that handle only LAN connections internally to companies. Finally, let's get into the modules that we can add to our routers for the new voice over IP world. The first one doesn't sound much like a voice over IP module. It's an ether switch module. And what this does is going right along with the theme of the integrated service routers. It allows you to slide LAN ports into your router and allow the router to be a switch as well. Essentially, you gain all of the switch syntax in your router's iOS. And it, a lot of people wondered why they moved the switches from the cat OS to the native iOS. This is why. It allows you to have the same operating system to manage both routers and switches. Now, the reason I put these modules in with the voice components is because think of the all-in-one office, where you now have the router, the switch, and these ether switch modules are or I should say can be equipped with inline power capability to power IP phones. So that allows you to have IP phones running off the same device as your router, your switch, your wireless LAN, the ultimate all-in-one. Now if you have the older routers, the 2600, 2600 XM, 3600, those styles, you'll have to buy carrier modules. Now back in the old days, when they first came out, we had NM1V and NM2V. And now you'll see a whole plethora of, of part numbers that are mixed in. You'll see like NMHD2VE, NMHD this, HD that. HD stands for high density. Now I know a lot of you are thinking of HDTV, which is high definition, uh, but this is high density, meaning they've packed more DSP processor modules inside of this, this carrier, allowing you to support more modules and do more resource uh, allocation with this. 
Uh, these DSPs, I know we haven't talked much about DSPs as of yet. Uh, we will in a little bit. But DSPs are used to support things like conference calls um, or putting somebody on hold or coding from analog voice to digital voice and putting it into a voice over IP packet. They're just little processors that go on top of this that supports the modules inside of there. The NM1V, the old one, used to just have just this blank slot where I could slide in a two-port FXS or two-port FXO card. Nowadays, Cisco said, well, why waste a whole module just on two ports? I mean, it seems like a, a cost waste, and also you're eating up real estate on your router. With the, NM, the new NM1Vs, you know, and the part numbers will vary, they've actually integrated a lot of times T1s right on there or E1 modules, or sometimes they'll put fast Ethernet ports to at least allow that module to serve some other purpose other than just housing the VIC card. Cisco also has an NM2V that's out there, and this is a carrier module capable of supporting two VIC cards inside of there. You also see this in a variety of part numbers as well, the high density, um, the, you know, adding more DSP resources to support cards like this, the uh, VIC-4FXS. Now, be very careful, because I know a lot of you are setting up labs, and you may be an eBayer like myself, and when you're looking at these, you'll see NM, uh, hang on, let me, at a uh, at a writable layer here, uh, you'll see an NM-1V and an NM-2V. These are the older modules that support one VIC card or two VIC cards. Unfortunately, just being on the cutting edge of technology that we are right now, these will support its own set of VIC cards. For instance, you'll see things like VIC. 2FXS that allows you to have two FXS ports, VIC 2FXO that allows you to have two FXO ports, and so on and so on. You'll see all these things as VIC cards. And, you know, we'll talk about the VICs in just a sec. But Cisco re-released these. I guess they didn't do it good enough the first time and re-released them as the high-density modules. But unfortunately, the individual VIC cards are not interchangeable. Here's what I mean. Uh, you might buy one that's like an NM... All right down here, an NM HD 2VE. That's one of the common ones I've seen. And this is a high-density one, meaning that it has uh, enhanced voice cards. That's what the E stands for. Um, and it supports two of them. It has a lot of DSP resources. But unfortunately, you cannot use these modules inside of this one. You'll see things like VIC 2 2 FXO, VIC 2 2 FXS. And this is painful because I've made the mistake of purchasing these cards for this module or vice versa, these VIC cards for these modules, and they are not interchangeable. So be careful. Watch out when you're buying those type of things. Uh, the VIC cards, they just keep coming out. There's more and more of them. I couldn't believe it when I heard the VIC 4 FX, FXO had come out that allowed four of these. I didn't think that they could actually jam four of these phone lines into a single module, but nonetheless, they did it. I don't know if they're using aluminum foil between these, but it's very thin. Um, so these will allow you to have, you know, I've just put the VICs because primarily you'll see VIC FXSs, FXOs, and ENM. Those are the th three flavors of VICs that you'll run into, the voice interface cards. Um, and they add just those respective ports. You'll see like 2FXS or 4FXS that dictates what kind of cards you're getting. Now, you'll also see a VWIC, which baffled me when I first heard about it because I thought you had WIC cards, wide, wide Area Network Interface cards, and you had VIC cards. So I was thinking, what's a VWIC? Well, these, I don't know if you can see, it's kind of a choppy picture, but this is actually a voice T1 line. So it's a Wide Area Network Interface designed for the voice network. And nowadays, when you buy these modules, Cisco, even if you need just a data T1, they'll probably sell you one of these because the VWIC will allow you to do a T1 for data, and you can code it as a data T1, or a T1 for voice. Whereas in the old days, with a WIC card, you can only have a T1 for data. It did not support voice characteristics. So that's why a lot of times when you buy these, these are just about the same price as the old T1 WIC cards. They come in, uh, this is a the model numbers on these, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, it's an MFT-2T1 uh, or E1 and 1T1 or E1. So that'll allow you to 
add one or two T1 lines, depending on what kind of capacity you're looking for. Um, and they just keep coming out. They have you know, higher capacity, lower capacity, VWIC cards, as we see more and more types of voice WAN connections coming out. So doesn't that just make you want to go out and buy stuff? I know I want to. So what we saw in this video was first off how we can equip our old routers and what old routers can be equipped with the new interfaces that Cisco is looking at to support the voice interface cards. We then looked at the very cool new routers, the integrated service line that allows you to have the ultimate all-in-one device that can do just about anything without adding any carrier modules. And then we looked at the interfaces themselves. We looked at the NM1V and 2V carrier modules for the old routers, and then the VIC cards and VWIC cards that we'll be able to use in the carrier modules or directly in those new routers. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.